Um, hi, everyone. Uh, we were going to start with our, uh, one of our uh, people on our panel who is uh, going to have a video, but it looks like we have a sound issue. So instead, I will uh, uh, start us off. Um, uh, welcome to our little conversation uh, on affect and computation titled Hard Feelings. Um, after the uh, fantastic uh, music by uh, Lord, um, I'm going to do my best uh, in just a few minutes to give a very brief intro to affect because I think a lot of us don't know what affect is. Um, but really, uh, maybe just listen to her music and her, read her lyrics, and I think that would save you a lot of uh, uh, reading. Um, uh, so, yeah, what is affect? Um, I'm not sure I know. It's a, uh, a strange, it's strange with affect because. Um, according to affect theory, affect is about uh, your feelings, your emotion, your kind of um, sensations before you can give them a word. And so you're working with a theory that is all about stuff that you can't describe. So this is a kind of um, interesting but uh, uh, challenging thing with affect theory. Um, this is maybe why many people are turned off by this kind of uh, theory. Um, especially if you're working in fields like, uh, or with things like computation, where in many cases it's all about precision and the important work of um, unpacking the black box. So uh, there's, a, there's you know, vagueness from affect theory and precision. Um, the kind of important work in uh, unpacking the black box, its practical, cultural, and political uh, implications. Um, but uh, many describe affect as feelings, information. I like that one. I, uh, the uh, energies um, and intensities. So I know technology can... of our situation um, uh, before we can give them an, an emotional label like happy, sad, pissed off, and so on. Um, maybe you know affect theory had a moment uh, a few years ago. If you work in academic theory, you might um, like all theories. It was kind of pattering along, and then it kind of flashed into greater attention. Um, uh, writers like um, Kathleen Stewart's really uh, lovely book, Ordinary Affects, from 2007. That's one nice place to start. Um, if you look at that book, it's, it's kind of unusual from, uh, uh, compared to many uh, texts. It's, uh, in it, Stewart gives little fragments and scenes from um, everyday life as it's caught in the kind of affective uh, moments of boredom, pain, love, austerity, and so on. Um, these scenes involve stuff like uh, scenes from a Walmart car park, car park, coal mining camps in West Virginia, bodies, body map, body map watching daytime television, um, stubbing out cigarettes on hands and the kind of scar tissues uh, that, that result, a stepson being swept away into a cycle of homelessness, um, a kind of brief but quite prescient and startling reading about the phenomenon of self-help racism in one of these communities. And this is uh, 2007, as I was saying, so kind of long before we're sitting here speaking of meme wars, Breitbart, the rise of kind of proactive alt-right racist boosterism. Um, so it's quite interesting to read these texts also um, 10 years later. Uh, Nina Power was speaking at the beginning of the conference about the need for um, a better libidinal analysis um, about these kind of um, situations. And she also quite <laughs> kind of touched on with me is she talked about the need for kind of unfashionable theory. Maybe we need to go back to uh, um, things like the body or psychology, psychoanalysis, um, uh, these kind of unfashionable theories, many might say. Um, uh, so we, we also want to do that, and especially uh, not just um, for any old reason, but to try to see if we can somehow make overlaps with things like computational culture and so on and see what happens when you do that. Um, well, we're thinking about doing that, and we're happy to have your uh, suggestions whether we should or not. Um, it's uh, just briefly, I think it's interesting to imagine what would have happened if some of these fields like software studies and other uh, writings working with um, uh, computation would have, uh, um, <laughs> uh, would have uh, uh, maybe, because they came around the same time. This is like the mid-2000s, software studies and affect theory were coming up at the same time. Um, and there wasn't a lot of overlap uh, in many cases. Um, uh, in a recent text by Adrian McKenzie on machine learning, a very nice text about machine learning, there's a tiny little footnote where he, um, just for a moment, um, he's, he's talking about optimization techniques in machine learning. And he starts to think about, in this footnote, oh, uh, there's this text by Berlant on cruel optimism uh, from affect theory. And he, he wonders, uh, you know, oh, 
is there something about cruel optimism, as Berlant describes it, that, that can um, help us think about optimization techniques in the fields like, uh, like, like um, back propagation and machine learning and so on. So that's a kind of exciting um, thing to try out, I, I imagine. Um, uh, and we also want to, um, you know, kind of particularly think about some of the pain points. That's what we call it, hard feelings. Uh, uh, of these intersections. So um, I'm going to uh, stop there because it's quite a busy panel. We have a lot of panelists. In, in fact, I don't really have time to give you their bios, but I'll just say we have, uh, you can read them online, obviously. We have Ellie Clark, we have Emile Devereaux, Helen Pritchard, myself, Magda Chile Carver. Uh, we have Convivial Studio, which is uh, Paul, uh, who's, who's worked together with Anne Christine. I've, I don't know where Anne Christine is standing. Uh, Anne Christine, right there. Uh, this is their work playing in the background. You're welcome to ask questions about it. We're not going to explain it, and it's crashed. So, um, uh, uh, and then I, I do want to introduce. Yeah, that's our fight. <laughs> I do want to introduce um, Shaka McLaughlin, who's going to come on your screen here, um, because he's, he couldn't make it here. So, um, he is um, an anthropologist. Or sorry, sorry, they. Sorry, they are an anthropologist um, who focuses on emergent media. They are Doris and Carl Kempner, Distinguished Associate Professor of Media Studies at Purchase College SUNY, as well as the author of the book, Virtual Intimacies, and a co-editor of Black Genders and Sexualities in Zombie Sexuality. Uh, they are currently at work on the book, Black Data, Queer of Color Critique Meets Network Culture Studies. And let's, let's give Shaka the stage. Hi. Um, so I know technology can always be a little bit finicky, so let's hope all of this works according to plan. I want to thank uh, the organizers for their invitation to present my work. I'm sorry I can't be with you there in person. I wrote a book that is sort of about affect, anyway it's in the title. So uh, Helen, Magda, and Eric asked me to say a little bit about the concept. But even after all of these years, I find the affect elevator pitch a little bit difficult. When I teach my undergraduates about affect, I used to use this example. Um, you know when you're, you've just seen or you think you've seen your ex's car roll by, uh, the one he told you he loved you in, um, and you, or rather your body, totally freaks out. Uh, and recently I've updated um, the example for the now nearly post-millennials, who some have dubbed iGen. Uh, here's an example of iGen here. Sparky, say hi. Hi. Um, so the iGen example would be, you know when you first see your ex's new bow on Instagram, they're showing off and then you go extra, you, your sense of yourself, uh, isn't that selfhood processing itself as itself, it's affecting the tingling shock across your body, the falling feeling in the pit of your stomach while your mind blanks out. That's affect, the capacity to be affected. Then after you narrativize the event, you figure out what it is that you're feeling. Uh, feelings are biographical and subjective. And then you tell all your friends about your feels. That's what emotions are. They're social. Got that? If you didn't, that's OK. Uh, my students often have blanked out looks, too. Um, ben Anderson is one of my favorite go-tos for refreshing my own understanding of affect. Uh, in his book, Encountering Affect, uh, Anderson offers two additions to the definition of affect as pre-personal bodily capacity I just offered. And these include affect as object target and affect as collective condition. Today, affects are engineered through design, data scraping, neural nets, and algorithms. They're the target of Apple, Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, Grindr, and all the rest. The Stanford Persuasive Tech Lab dedicates itself to these efforts. And on their website, they don't even try to smooth over what it is that they're doing though they do try to offer examples of tools they're developing um, to help people change their behavior and beliefs. Um, you know, things like Fitbit or meditation apps. Engineering affect is increasingly molecular. That is, it gets all the way into things, as Deleuze predicted in his postscript on societies of control. The persuasive tech lab calls the study of computers as persuasive technology, captology. Control, captology, whatever. It's no accident we pick up our phones dozens, even hundreds of times a day. People talk about addiction, and they mean it. Could you please turn off your notification? Thank you. Uh, this is one affect as collective condition. Uh, we're in this alone together. Bodies being affected, targeted, are also always imbricated in a set of relations that extend beyond them. Capacities are always collectively formed, like irritation at the sound of notifications. So lately, Sparky and I have been 
having conversations uh, about how conversations within earshot of our phones quickly appear as ads on our Instagram feeds. Uh, we repeat to one another and anyone willing to listen uh, to our maybe not paranoia, Instagram is listening. Of course, it might not be listening, uh, though it probably is. It might just be some AIs whose predictive capacities are exceptional. It thinks you probably don't even know it yourself yet, but you're going to need to buy a new pillow soon. Bell Hooks's Killing Rage was published in 1995. I often disagree with her, but she definitely got this title right. Sometimes I get triggered into moods I call Kill Whitey. A few of these triggers come immediately to mind. Anti-black violence, um, the limited access people of African descent have to education, adequate health care, or economic mobility, to say nothing of everyday racisms and their normalization in the wake of Trump's election. The anthropologist João Costa Vargas has called these living histories of dispossession black genocide. It sounds like an exaggeration, but then think of how black flourishing, especially but not only in the United States, hits your ears. Even when I say it out loud, it sounds like an oxymoron, and I scrunch my face up trying to imagine alternatives. It doesn't always get better. Sometimes it just gets bitter. Last summer, I received through a proxy a message from a senior administrator who had concerns about my relationship with a former student. Say hi, Sparky. Hi. And whether I really was at a residency fellowship the college had granted me time away to attend. While I figured out how to respond, I dug through often difficult to find institutional data. I compared my salary to those of others at my institution. I revisited the number of my fellow faculty of African descent. You better believe I have some hard feelings. So what does this have to do with computation or digital cultures? I've been working on a project in which I'm lumping together the surveillance of blackness, the transformation of black life into demographic problems and vectors of risk, and all of the many forms of technological mastery to which black people are subjective in the living after lives of slavery to an atmospheric heuristic I call black data. A brief aside, when the Snowden revelations briefly shocked many Anglo-Americans and Europeans, POC didn't exactly shrug their indifference, but nor did they offer an outpouring of empathy. Yeah, you too. My Hello. Yeah. So we're going to come back to Shaika. We wanted to uh, uh, take a, a moment to move over to someone else and return to that in a moment later. Is my body out of date? The development and penetration of smartphones and social media into our intimate and everyday lives over the past two decades has had a massive impact on the way we perceive, experience, perform and exist in the world, personally, professionally and politically. The fact we can do so much remotely and can present so much of ourselves online calls into question the necessity of physical presence as well as the agency of the body as our primary mode of interaction with the world. On the other hand, our online environment is often a mirror of the offline. On the whole, we are not anonymous. Our physicality gets dragged in. On social media, our race, age, sexuality, physical location and gender is logged and often broadcast. On Google, our browsing histories are tracked, and what we encounter online is often determined by this data. Therefore, we are frequently still subject to the same privileges and prejudices that we encounter offline as a result of our subjectivity and our environmental and political contexts, even though our body is not present. Meanwhile, elite discourses, led largely by white, hetero, cis males about artificial intelligence, virtual reality, 
extraplanetary escape, transhumanism and immortality make promises of a post-body paradise. But this will not be available to everyone. Those of us left behind remain subject to and affected by our fleshy physicality, which, in the face of escapist theories and online action, increasingly begins to feel like a drag, a burden, posing the question, is my body out of date? Drag is the primary analytic and artistic research tool through which I examine and play with the tension that exists between the feeling that being free of a body would be easier on the one hand, and the queer intersectional feminist implications of attaining this on the other. For the more the digital image takes center stage in the creation, performance and presentation of identity, the more the physical body falls into the shadow of her omnipresent digital descriptions. Where the digital body flies to people and places unimaginable, the fleshy body, clunky in its physicality, drags behind, archaic and almost rotten in its inability to be in more than one place at once. The digital image allows identity to be plural and promiscuous. I consider drag from four angles, dragging down, as described above, dragging up, as a way of reinscribing physicality in all its messy, unimproved glory, dragging away, as a mode of escape, and dragging across, multiple bodies embodying a single common identity as a call to action, participation, collaboration and designed confusion, in the face of neoliberal, individualist, positivist claims to identity. Those of us left behind remain subject to and affected by our fleshy physicality, which, in the face of festive theories and online action, increasingly begins to feel like a drag, a burden, posing the question, is my body out of date? But this will be not available to everyone. Meanwhile, elite discourses led largely by white, hetero, cis males about artificial intelligence, virtual reality, extraplanetary escape, transhumanism and immortality make a promises of a post-body paradise. My digital body flies to people and places unimaginable, your fleshy body, clunky in its physicality, drags behind, archaic and almost rotten in its inability to be in more than one place at once. Negotiating the in-between. Presence, absence, absence, presence. Ich dachte sie war da. Aber sie ist in einer anderen Welt. Ich dachte, sie war da, aber sie ist in einer anderen Welt. Ich bin in einer Welt, aber es gibt nicht mehr so als wir. Ich bin in einer Welt, aber es gibt nicht mehr so als wir. Ich bin in einer Welt, aber es gibt nicht mehr so als wir. Ich bin in einer Welt, aber es gibt nicht mehr so als wir. Ich bin in einer Welt, aber es gibt nicht mehr so als wir. Ich bin in einer Welt, aber es gibt nicht mehr so als wir. Ich bin allein, 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 
These points of resistance raise the following questions. One, what are the emancipatory possibilities of digital and physical drag, especially when performed collectively? What new perspectives and experiences can emerge from this? Two, if the stage can be set for the possibility of a past body identity, what potentials emerge for, from being freed from the constraints and prejudice the physical body elicits? Three, to what extent can physical performance hack and confuse the digital, through identical clothing, conflated identities, untaggable faces, pre-recorded and live projections and shared social media accounts, and how could this be used as a tool for social or political resistance? What are the ethics of taking on other identities, online and offline? physical location and gender is locked and often broadcast. The fact I can do so much remotely and can present so much of myself online calls into question the necessity of physical presence as well as the agency of the body as my primary mode of interaction with the world. To explore this, I drag drag through theory and practice in four different directions, down, as in the physical burden described above, dragging up, as a way of exaggerating physicality with all its messy, abject, unimproved glory, dragging away, as a mode of escape or becoming untraceable, and dragging across, multiple bodies embodying and performing a single common identity as a call to action, participation, collaboration and confusion in the face of neoliberal, individualist positivist claims to identity. Your data is becoming my most highly valued identifying feature. Every
every individual scene is no more than an orgy of algorithms, which uninvited guests are increasingly paying or not paying to play with. And you have to keep up. Each new popular technological development requires a revision, upgrade of concepts and practices of privacy and intimacy, as well as of presence and absence in ways that are personal and political, public and private, state-driven and individual. I'm dragged up, down, across, and away by the tension between the perceived burden of flashy physicality in the digital age, on the one hand, if it would be easier to be free of my body. And the queer intersectional feminist implications of attaining this on the other. Where would I be without my body? Believe me, this drag is taking place online and offline. Networked and separately. Definitely set against the backdrop of elite discourses of artificial intelligence, extraplanetary escape, and of course, theories of transhumanism. Which leaves those of us for whom such an escape is not possible, feeling that our bodies are out of date. Our, our physicality, physicality a An orgy of algorithms, darling an orgy of zeros and ones. Waiting for ice cream, waiting for the best picture, waiting for the puppy, waiting for the cop, waiting for the direction, waiting for my erection, waiting for your erection, waiting for her erection, waiting for erection, waiting for the words to be done. Waiting for the loop, waiting for the loop, waiting for a revelation, waiting for revolution, waiting for no, waiting for sense, waiting for endorsement, waiting to be paid, waiting to be looked at, waiting for work, waiting to be linked in. Thank you, and uh, also a very big thank you to Vladimir, who joined us all the way from Belgrade. Lipstick out of the way. Um. Okay, my writing investigates the situatedness of media interventions and the role that bodies or embodiment plays in these actions. Uh, with a background in tactical media in the early 1990s, my writing and research intertwines with digital media practices. In this current writing, I'm interested in the places and possibilities for action in what evades calculation and quantification in human and more than human relations. In this case, I investigate the situation of the uncanny. A rethinking of the uncanny provides a clear example of a strong sensation, one that makes an impact upon us, a strong sensation that compels us to act or asks us if we want to act, a strong sensation that we retain written into memory. Of course, Mishiro Mori's description of the uncanny valley in the 1970s described the revulsion experienced in the encounter with humanoid robots, where the sense of the human and the non-human create an uncomfortable sensation. Mori's advice is to stop developing human-like design in robotics before reaching the uncanny valley, to make obvious the mechanical elements and, 
Indeed, uh, this point is where the most interesting robotic developments occur. Mori advocates limiting the design to the safe side of the mechanical. Instead, some engineers in the field of robotics over the past 40 years use Mori's concept of the uncanny valley to set the standard of what to overcome in the field of robotics. And we could definitely argue that recently, yes, humanoid robots have been developed that cross this divide. In which case, then, here's my question. If robotics has already reached the point in its development where there is no longer an experience of the uncanny valley, if the robots have crawled out of the uncanny valley, so to speak, and we are now feel comfortable enough with some of them to not have a sensory experience that's described as uncanny, then what's the role of the uncanny? But before we go any further, there's a problem with defining the uncanny. Of the many historical examples of scholars who, firstly, they have to perform the labor of pinpointing the uncanny's definition. So Freud, Heidegger, Samuel Weber, Nicholas Rourke, other psychoanalysts, philosophers, and humanities scholars all are forced to begin their discussions by unpicking and writing lengthy definitions for the woolly term uncanny. But rather than uh, reflecting epistemologies and projecting them onto this talk, I'd rather that each of us get in touch with our own uncanny experiences um, in order to find your own definition. So before I go any further, I'd like you to just take a moment for this exercise um, to just close your eyes if you'd like or put down your phone for a moment and think about what the uncanny uh, might mean to you. So when in your life have you had an experience of the uncanny? And what's the very first thing that comes to your mind? So choose that very first experience and, and ask yourself, what did it feel like? Where were you? What happened? Okay, so, so hopefully you've kind of come up with something, at least, at least vaguely. Um, and now I'd like you to just try to describe the mixture of sensations that you experienced as part of the uncanny. So would you say there was fear or maybe some pleasure? Perhaps confusion? Um, now I'd like to ask, is your encounter with the uncanny more about an experience of a place or an object? Uh, what were the exact elements that contributed to producing that sensation? Um, for you, did it have something to do with materiality or a bodily mix-up? Or something being alive or maybe not? Were there elements of repetition or deja vu? Did it have something to do with losing your place um, and here resonating with the German connotations of a loss of home? Okay, so, so hopefully that's helped you find some way to kind of enter into this discussion. And I'm not the only one who argues that the uncanny produces a strong sensation, uh, one that resonates not only when one is present to the experience, but that the intensity of the uncanny encounter also writes itself into one's memory. And therefore, I think we should take note of it. So what, what does trouble me is a sidelining of the uncanny in robotics development. And this is due in part to its qualities as a complex emotion. A critical reflection of the mimetic properties of AI, the mimetic quality of the superhuman robots, seems to leave out the all too human uncanny experience, at least at this stage. As a troubling sensory experience difficult to pin down, and express outwardly through facial expression, when the humanoid robots reflect back to us, we are left on our own to experience the uncanny. So the uncanny is a disconnect in the mimetic loop. So for example, uh, Sophia, the celebrity humanoid robot developed by Hanson Robotics. Um, I've not had the pleasure of encountering her face to face. Um, Sophia's developers opt to expose her cranial mechanisms, intentionally following Maury's advice. Although, the fact that Sophia has recently been granted citizenship in Saudi Arabia is a sign of the desire of humans to accept her into a community and perhaps one sign of her success 
and taking steps outside of the uncanny valley. In the world of robotics, the outward-facing Sophia charms audiences and sells technical achievements in AI that exist beyond her own capabilities. So, Sophia's current stupidity renders her unthreatening and ultimately likable. She's not quite intelligent, but she's considered a rapidly evolving being on the path towards super intelligence. So it's important to, to get the arrangements straight. Um, Sophia, on, on that side of the screen, uh, is the public face for something far less tangible. She's designed to represent a benevolent superhuman artif artificial general intelligence as developed by Ben Goertzel and a team of developers. So Hanson Robotics are animaton animatronic characters who operate as interface, literally through their faces, and other mimetic human-like mirroring of emotional responses, movements, and facial expressions. Hanson Robotics are empowered by open source AI, which is mostly adapted toy model code, similar to that of simulated worlds, where activities are guided by physiological choices to maintain homeostasis. So for example, uh, the kind of code that simulated little trains used in order to know to get water and lumps of coal and have a decision-making structure based on meeting certain goals. The adaptation of the toy model code adds emotional states as part of the decision structure. So emotion is considered a part of the control infrastructure that maintains a complex system within a complex environment. Uh, so there's all these different kinds of approaches to code that are sort of feeding behind the background to this interface of uh, Hansen's robotics. Goertzel's recent collaborations with cognitive neuroscientist Dr. Julia Mossbridge aim precisely to cement a bond between human and more than human through the development of loving AI. Using Sophia as the appealing interface, the developers are designing AI to love unconditionally, and in so doing, to help guide people in loving ways. As interface, Sophia falls into the trap of a surface reading. Sacrificing feminist discourse, Sophia represents stereotypes of the feminine as a non-threatening, nurturing object of desire that invites participants to let down their guard. Transparency in this interface meets the goal of communicating emotions, of connecting on an emotional level. As Gertzel explains, we have developed software enabling a robot or avatar to recognize and mirror a human's facial expressions and vocal quality. On the perceptual side, we have used deep neural networks to create tools that assess a person's emotion from their facial expression and their tone of voice. The idea is that assessment of the user's emotional state will allow the system to modulate its behavior appropriately and significantly enhance the interactive bonding experience of the user. So while the human behaviors are the model for the robotic actions, the Loving AI project aims to produce unconditionally loving beings that can guide humans in how to love. Initial pilot studies have tested both one-on-one -on -one and group interactions with Sophia, uh, who guides participants in meditation and activities such as blink mirroring. Their studies show reduced heart rate during these interactions, taken as one of the indications of a more relaxed and loving state. Mossbridge reports how during blink mirroring, uh, when people syn synchronize their blinks, they have a feeling of being closer and liking each other more. But we didn't know the strength of it until hearing from the participants on the final day. They felt most, most strongly that there was a real connection between them and the robot. And the connection itself, that is the interpersonal space, is what allowed them to really do the work of meditation and self-exploration that they really wanted to do. She goes on to say, as we interviewed participants about their experiences, it gradually became clear that there is something special about being with a being that's human-like, enough to make your mind feel that another person is there, seeing you, mirroring you, paying close attention to you, while at the same time this being is not judging you, presumably judging you like a human being would judge you, 
um, that Sophia has no ulterior motives. So, techno-utopianism aside, one might consider that the uncanny experience of the human here plays an important role, so what the human is, is experiencing. Although the uncanny feeling is not mirrored in the humanoid robot and therefore re represents a disconnect, the pleasure associated with the uncanny experience may actually play a part in the construction of these experiences of well-being. Lauren Berlant suggests, be open to he who comes up to you, be open to the encounter. The intimacy of the encounter, what Berlant describes as between two people just standing there linked newly, is not defined by talking, but rather an opening of a space. So perhaps it may be an encounter of nearly people, um, or perhaps an encounter of the more than human. Um, this encounter for Berlant also represents a danger of being open to an encounter that is potentially transformative. Berlant describes this openness as uncoded, and I see this as the uncanny, the emotive code that does not express itself facially, but nonetheless holds power over us. The uncanny as a recognition of being lost in unknowing, of seeing connections on multiple registers of one's body, but not being able to pin them down. The uncanny as a placeless suspension. As Berlant suggests, in this moment of suspension, a break from the hum of the normal buzz of everyday operations, there's an instinctual sensing of the collective buzz, a sense of proximity to the hum of the universe instead. Berlant also asks, what are the consequences of detaching, even for a moment, from the consensual mirage? A question asked via Marx about our compliance within everyday relations with property and dependable life. Is even a momentary connection with a humanoid robot a potential detaching from the concrete real of humankind's community? Unfortunately not. Habermas describes man's cultivation of an image of himself as fundamentally shaped in transactions of feeling, not capital, by participation in a community of love among people who choose each other. So I end here um, with an image of the two sides of interface in the Hanson Robotics Loving AI Open Cog Continuum. Uh, so we've got on the one side, the Sophia interface, and then this kind of open area of code and the sort of freedom of a lack of materiality in the middle, where there's a lot of techno-utopianism and, and promises. So from the public-facing interface of Sophia and other humanoid robots who fall into stereotypes of gender, race, and culture, to the deep neural networks developed by Gertzel and his colleagues on the other side, um, so at the very the far end behind uh, Sophia, SingularityNet uh, is a techno-utopian enterprise to distribute AI applications via blockchain so that artificial intelligence will not end up entirely in the control of corporate hands. Rather, um, SingularityNet will allow individual en entities to link together to share and distribute AI code. The freedom of thought embedded in the possibilities of writing code are unfortunately material boxed in on either end by the enterprise's recent release of a cryptocurrency. The buzz of the chat site echoes not lofty debates about distributed intelligence, but rather a misinformed Sophia bot reappears and repeats incorrect information over and over again. While juvenile machismo bantering predominates, echoing speculation and misinformation and phishing links recycle over and over dreams of hot rod cars and muscle-bound bodies amidst lies inflated boasts of riches gained tall tales of tokens obtained thanks Thanks to uh, Emil for taking us on that walk with Sophia.
So I'm going to um, try and uh, shift mode a little bit now, and I want uh, to take us instead on a walk with another type of non-human animal um, from some of the work and research that I've been doing on animal hackers. So this is a scene that I find myself in. As I walk along the packed promenade, a particular entanglement draws my attention. As I approach the edge of the promenade, I notice cattle wandering alongside dogs and families. One is wearing a large box mounted on a leather collar. The collar is very similar to the reflective collars and bells worn by many of the feral animals that walk the streets in Hong Kong. But this one is unmistakably electronic. A reinforced plastic electronic enclosure hangs from a leather collar around the cow's head. On the collar, it looks like a GPS antennae, a small rubber-coated prong, similar to the ones that I've often used in DIY electronics. I'm sure probably many of you have got them in your studios. On the large plastic enclosure is a logo that reads Low Tech. I take a photo, and when I get back home, I Google the device to discover that it's one of 180 GPS collars that were purchased by the Hong Kong government to track the feral cows through the city. And these feral cows had been demarcated as a nuisance. So for many years they had just been going about their business, but at this point had become recognized as a kind of nuisance that needed to be dealt with. A particularly what we might think of as a hard feeling of relation towards these uh, cattle that roam the streets. And as, at this point, I kind of thought about Lauren Ballant's work and the, the way in which she asks us to think about what's going on here. So how might we think about what's going on here in some of these computational practices? And Ballant kind of recounts the story of when you enter a room at a party and you kind of have a sense of feeling um, and you kind of start to look around and admits, as she says, the rise and flow of intensities we need to provoke the need to think and to adjust and to slow things down and to gather things up, to find things out, to wonder and ponder. And again, Kathleen Stewart describes this is very much when you feel on the verge of something, that something's happening in these entanglements, something's snapping, wearing out, it's overwhelming, it's underwhelming, or it's just different. And perhaps we might think about this feeling as a kind of effective underbelly of face value. So, you know, what is kind of the underbelly of face value? Where we might need to linger and ponder, as many of the speakers and the audience have been doing throughout the conference, actually, to try and understand what the felt experience of computation and the computation of life is. An experience which often feels different um, from what we are presented with um, at its face. And this is in a way to engage with computation and effect, also as a very continually shifting terrain. Um, as Sarah Ahmed reminds us, it's not to settle things, so this panel is not a kind of answer to what effect and computation is, but instead to ask in this shifting scene what matters here. So we have these two kind of questions of what's going on here and what matters here. And very much like queer feelings, um, we probably want to keep our hard feelings unsettled in the same way, um, because both queer feelings and hard feelings are anything but seemingly or manageable. So back at the promenade, I walk alongside uh, the city cow until she reaches the refuse recycling site, where she stops to join a number of other cattle and water buffalo, and they pick through they pick through the rubbish left from the New Year's barbecue, uh, which the local papers are often report on, and this has been part of the reason why they've been demarcated as a nuisance. Um, and of course, we might think about how the nuisance uh, has been also applied to thinking and work within queer theory. So through the introduction of these low-tech wild cell collars, very much the effective activities of cows, of the, their feral roots and habitats start to unfold in computational environments. It's a kind of materializing of data. 
of GIS maps as the cows wearing these collars move across Hong Kong. The polygons of GIS materialize as invisible fences that aim to both control their foraging behavior, but also to locate them in order to administer reproductive controls. So it's a kind of sterilize and kill program. The data that's collected on their foraging transmits the feral cow's activities into a set of locational coordinates, time stamps, angles, particular sequences of temporal movements and non-movement that get identified as foraging, lying down or browsing. And so we can say that these feral cows and their effective foraging activities become quantified through this mattering of data. It's the transmission of hard feelings into hard data. Um, and that's something probably we can think about in relation to many other types of transmissions that hard, put a hard feeling into hard data. So this data is mapped, it's stored in a database, uh, and when the officers need to access it, they'll text from their mobile phones. And they use this to monitor any rebellious activities in locations that they're interested in. So for example, after they relocated many cattle, they found them rebelling, rebelling back to, and walking back to the streets where they wanted to peruse the market stalls or eat out of the rubbish bins. And they use this GPS collar to alert officers to that activity and then appropriate action is uh, operated to lead them away. So any type of rebellion is tracked by the data and is um, dealt with. So we might pause here for a moment to think about how non-human animals, such as feral cows or feral cats or other types of animals, have entered into academia or into theory. And in some way, it's very similar to the way lesbians and queers have entered into theoretical discussions, often in a way of benevolence. We see in the history of queer theory the way in which queer human bodies, like non-human bodies, have been studied, surveyed, managed as an optic through which those populations are called in and controlled. As Jasper Puar uh, notes, this is a kind of a recasting of queerness as an optic that makes operative technology in the production, disciplining, and maintenance of population. So indeed, these kind of feral cows are tracked by the GPS monitors or uh, queers who are studied by theoretical uh, discourses in academia seem to only become perceptible and determined through computation these moments of maintenance and management. And this is very much the maintenance and management of affect that's taking place. However, these uh, moments are still effective scenes. And in the case of the cattle that are monitored by GPS, they become determinant through their foraging um, as a way to manage this nuisance behavior. Um, but they also become kind of pre-coded into a system so, much like heteronormativity or homonormativity that has a real uh, material determining force on their lives. So through the computation of movement, ferals become included in the civic processes of governance and management, very much through their effective movements. Um, Monique Alwert, people might know her work, the post-colonial scholar, notes that historically colonial um, and incipient capitalism were very much dependent on the movement of non-human animals, plants, microbes between climates and continents in ways that constantly change them. So capitalism actually was working through this tracking of movement, this control of movement of animals and microbes and so on. And today we might see this GPS monitoring of cattle as a type of neo-colonial computing that attempts to regulate these organisms, these feral animals, through the use of computational infrastructures. In particular, it's a monitoring of life, and it decides you know, who gets to be part of a cared-for public, okay? whether these feral cows are part, part of a cared-for public or demarcated as outside of that. So the GPS tracking of these cows presents, of course, as well, a monetary value. Um, enrolling their activities through the quantification of movement, the generation of data, 
uh, within the reproductions and temporalities of advanced capitalism. And in addition, the low-tech wild cell also normalizes the feralisms of living outside a domestic or controlled space. So it kind of brings back in these feral activities into the flows of advanced capitalism, through which their involvement in monitoring systems and big data infrastructures become part of that reproduction. However, what I discovered when I was uh, doing my research and um, spending time with these feral cows and some of the people who are engaging with them, there's actually a flip side to the violence, which is the site of the potential exploitation by the cows of this technology. And that is that the GPS collars themselves start to become feral, and foraging becomes a new force that breaks the modes of governance and reorganizes the daily activities of the officers who are called to lead them out of places or uh, the people who are kind of phoning in and trying to get their data. So although the AFCD set out to control and reduce the numbers of feral cattle, actually this data has been taken on by group, many groups of activists around Hong Kong who have, through the kind of sharing on social media um, and through other types of um, networks, have highlighted the need to care for the cattle and have demanded that the government supply them with this GPS data, which instead of actually reducing the number of cattle that roam the streets, has in some aspects uh, actually led to them, the people making demands that they actually have uh, habitable spaces. So two community activists on the Lantau Island explained to me that their local uh, population had two of these GPS collars and they would regularly request the data. Um, and so in this case, we can really see that the GPS collar becomes feralized, so affect becomes feralized by these uh, animals and by these community activists. And through affect, their data is no longer confined to this reproduction and this particular constraint of movement in, within the database, but instead becomes exploited as an organizing force for an, a kind of alternative collective life in the city. So just coming to the, to the end, I guess, a couple more minutes. Um, I want to propose really, and I want to kind of also open this up and perhaps for the discussion, that computational practices as they've 